Right now, what we are going to do tonight in 55 minutes is going to talk you through three stages of what I consider to be the most important stages of the bar. The first is getting your foot through the door of chambers. The second is how to make a career once you're in. And the third is what do we aspire to when we are barristers? Who are the greats that really, to me, advocate in the way in which I would dream of so doing? Now, the first is my usual. It's a health check. It's a caveat. It's a warning. I am a trial lawyer, all right? I come to life in court. I thrive on cross-examination. I love the adrenaline surge. I am a legal aid practitioner through and through, and you cut my veins, you'll find the government's money pouring out of it into the vacant world that has existed in legal aid since LASPO. That means I don't know anything about what it's like to be a barrister in shipping or trusts or conveyancing or having a paper practice. So everything I have to say to you tonight is based on my world, which is a courtroom trial world in the field of common law, based on family and crime. Okay? So no tricky questions at the end about what happens in, in terms of death and divorce. So what are we going to do? Right. The first thing you're going to be talked about is getting a foot in the door. It says what it says on the tin. So I'm going to go through these in a little bit of detail, but I am not going to go through these in the type of detail that you might want if you're seriously thinking about putting your application in now, in which case you're too late, you've missed it this year. Um, because one, there's a lecture handout which contains the detail, but two, actually, I can only hope in the next 10, 15 minutes where I'm focusing on this subject, just to give you the headline points. You must take responsibility for accessing all the information there is on the web, from the bar school, from the inns, and from chambers, and from the bar council, so that you understand what the process is about. And actually, I'm not apologetic about saying that to you, because the one thing that you are going to have to demonstrate if you want to be a barrister is that you are a self-directed, self-motivated, independent learner who's prepared to seek out information yourself and then apply it to the cause, okay? So, what do you need? Well, the first thing you need, before you even get to look at these symbols on the uh, inns, is you need to get a degree. And you need to get either a 2-2, in reality a 2-1 or higher. If you don't do a law degree, then you're going to need to do a conversion course where the same grades are required. Before you can even contemplate coming to bar school, which is the next stage of adjusting to what it's like to learn to become a barrister, you have to join an inn. And you can join one of these four inns, Middle, which is mine, Little Ra Ra for Middle Temple here, uh, Gray's Inn, Lincoln's Inn, and Inner Temple. And the reason you have to join an inn is based on history, because in the days before there was any formal learning process, going to an inn and sitting with the barristers and eating with them, as we call dining, some people call it drinking, <laughs> um, is where actually you started to pick up the tips of the trade. You were sitting next to more senior people, you understood what they'd be doing in court, they would talk to you as equals, one hopes, not asking you to go and shovel out their grates. Uh, but that will be the way in which you absorb the learning, almost by osmosis. And that relationship of training and support continues to this day, because the inns now are a massive resource for learning and support and mentoring and also money. But before you go anywhere near to thinking if you're going to take that money up, you must apply to join. What do you do next? Well, you recognise when you're choosing an inn, you are choosing an inn for life. So you look at it not just in terms of what scholarships it offers, but you look at it in terms of are you going to be supported there? Do they have people like you there? Do they have an LGBTQ group? Do they have a BAME group? Do they have the type of ethos which is going to embrace you and support you when you hit the buffers, as you surely will, because none of us have a straightforward route to the bar? Do they have a type of policy which means when you're really having difficulties, you can be allocated a mentor to try to guide you the way through? And then look at the scholarships to see if you stand a chance of applying. But choose your ring carefully, because once you choose one, that's it for life, and you can't apply for scholarships to more than one in. So... You can see it's financial help. You can see about being called to the bar. That's the stage where you've passed your uh, exams and you get a chance to think about becoming a barrister. Think about training weekends. Think about it as an extension of what you might have experienced at university or at college. 
but in an environment where you'll be mixing with lots of people from different backgrounds you've never encountered before. After having completed the qualifying law degree, I'm going to move over here just for a little variety. Let's hope the camera can track me. Um, then that's when you start thinking about whether you're going to put your money into this process of becoming a barrister. Now, the change this year is a significant one because for the first time you don't have to invest all of your money at the outset of your degree by thinking, am I going to actually make it through the bar finals? Before it was 18 and a half grand and you put that money in up front. Now what's happening is not only has the competition been enlarged so that there is now a lower rate generally for the two years, I think it's 15,000, the details are in the handout, but actually stage one, you only have to put up I'm hoping I've got the figures there, because I won't otherwise remember. You only have to put up, I say only, it's still a large amount of money, but nothing by comparison, 1575. And the reason that's important is it enables you to dip your toe into the training waters to see if you've got the aptitude and you're prepared to go on to stage two. And it has a filtering out test, an aptitude test, and if you fail that, you won't be invited to continue into stage two. If you do go to stage two, that's when you pay the money up. Those figures are absolute. The second stage, part two, um, includes all course and textbooks. The 295 is the fee you're going to pay to the uh, bar standards uh, board. But it's at that stage you're going to be thinking and needing to have scholarships. You can apply for scholarships to get you through that case. You don't have to wait until you apply for a pupillage. So Rahena Papal, uh, someone who is a truly inspirational young woman, she won the 100 Years Inspirational Award uh, last November. I don't begrudge the fact at all she beat me. <laughs> but um, she is an example of how you can literally jump the groove from your background and how scholarships are there to help you get through a process that is otherwise financially um, unattainable. Okay, the statistics. This is where, if you had gin in any glass in front of you, you'd be sipping it now and then moving on to the arsenic, okay? <laughs> the hard facts, right, enrolments for the bar course are huge, okay? One, six, two, four, and the volume of pupillages is 435. Pupillage applicants annually are 3,000. Now, that is a terrifying statistic, one in eight of you won't get anywhere near contemplating having a career at the bar. But don't look at the statistics in the abstract because we have a very, very high proportion of overseas students who never intend to stay in the United Kingdom to practice in the United Kingdom. They want the kudos and the intellectual satisfaction of getting the degree and the qualifications and the bar finals um, marks in, in this country. And then they go back to Malaysia, lots of our students come from Malaysia, to Hong Kong, and they don't therefore remain in the United Kingdom to be part of your competition pool. Also consider the applications for pupillages, 3,000, includes those people that didn't get pupillage the year before, and that's not unusual. That doesn't mean to say that they are failures. It just goes to demonstrate it's very, very hard to get in. But that's why a repeat application the year after, or sometimes the year after that, and sometimes the year after that, enables you, if you want to achieve this career, to fill the gaps in your CV or experience that enable you to get there. So yes, the statistics are scary, and you cannot come in to contemplating a career at the bar unless you know it's going to be a very, very high hill to climb. And there is a good reason for that. In the same way you'd want to know that the surgeon who is opening you up and knows what to do with your organs and isn't going to take out your kidney when it should be something else, you don't want to place your future in the hands of someone that you can't trust to articulate your case. And that is why the filtering system at the beginning is brutal. It's not a perfect system, but it's the only one we've got. So, pupillage, the application process. Can you argue your own case? What are you seeking to showcase? Have you done so economically with words and evidentially with facts? Can you be your own advocate? Now, why have I got that up there as a screenshot? It's because it is remarkable how many calls I get from people who haven't got pupillage who come to me without any clear idea about why they have been rejected. And it's normally apparent within about 10 minutes why that is the case. I'll give you an example. One happened last week. 
Hello. Um, could I speak to Joe Delahunty, please? Yes, you may. Who's talking? Uh, my name is X. Um, oh, that's interesting. And I'm ringing you up because I want to know how to get a pupillage. Oh, well, that's interesting, too. I didn't realise I was phoning a friend. No introduction as to how they got my name or my number. No explanation as to why they think I might have the time to talk to them then. And then as I then go on to discover, after there has been a rambling explanation, which I've had to listen to very, very, very hard to try to work out what the point of the question is and then try to unravel it, is it then clear that actually they want my help either by introducing them to a chambers, for example, although they may have come to a couple of lectures, apparently that might be a bus pass into chambers, or because we have a friend in common. And it is remarkably clear that they haven't done the very basics. One, they don't know who I am in reality. Two, they haven't Googled me to find out what type of law I do, so when they ring me up asking about shipping, I'm really not going to be able to help. <laughs> Three, they haven't actually identified why they have a problem in getting pupillage. And what they are doing in reality is delivering a problem to me to solve instead of coming to me asking how they can help to resolve the problem they are, they are in. As a barrister, you have got to be a problem solver. You have got to be curious. Like I've said before, you've got to be self-motivated to learn, and you've also got to be able to deal with failure. Because every time you go into court, one of you is going to fail because you won't win the case. So just let's have a little pause there, shall we, while the ripple of that realisation just drips through. Okay? You will lose, especially if you're opposite me. <laughs> yeah. so, so the point is that when you are applying to the bar, you have to understand it's an incredibly competitive business against very able people who will want the same things as you and will have the same skills that they are trying to deploy as you and what is going to be your special skill set? What are you going to demonstrate? So this is why it comes as a massive surprise to the people that ring me up, who always get a respectful response. But my answer is, treat applying to the bar as though it's the case. You are the client. What's the case? What are you advocating for? Where are the weak points? Identify your weak points and make sure they are not so weak. Buff up your strong points. This is the first case you're going to argue, and it cannot have a more important subject because it's you and your future. That's what you need to be doing every time you think about this application process. Now, there is this absolutely remarkable uh, website. There are many on there, but I've singled this out both on this um, shot and also in the notes because it is written by the two stages of professionals you want to hear from at the bar. The first is a successful pupil. The second is a very senior silk. The pupil took castings from everyone else that was going through the application in her year, I think it was 2018, and ended up generously sharing all of the knowledge she had gained about how to prepare for a pupillage interview with the world. That illustrates the very best there is at the bar, which is of being generous with knowledge. And it's moderated and um, also checked by a senior silk as well as other people. It is the go-to resource. It's one of many. If you're not on Twitter, you need to be, because as I say, Twitter is full of very, very able senior silks and groups who are there to try to answer your questions about what it's really like at the bar, because there is a genuine intention to make it more inclusive. So in my intention to make it more inclusive, let's move on to the pupillage application forms. When you are thinking about an application form, you need to think about it as your first written advocacy test. I am not interested, if I read your form, in the fact that age eight, you watched Silks on TV and you wanted to be Meghan Markle. That's really not going to help me. It's not going to help me that you really admire Brenda Hale. We all do. I am not interested in who you admire. What I am interested in is what have you done as a result of your motivation to come to the bar? What have you done to achieve an outcome for someone or something or some organisation as a result of you putting into practice why you want to come to the bar? So there is no point wasting valuable words in any application form or letter asking for a mini pupillage, for example, which says, 
I wanted to be a barrister since the age of eight. I want to make a difference and change the world and help people. <laughs> that is not going to help. It crops up time and time again in many forms. What we want to know is, what situation have you encountered which you have felt was unjust? What have you done as a result? What was the outcome? Situation, action, outcome. That's exactly what we try to do at the bar. That's what you should be thinking of in terms of your application form. And what's more, think ahead. This should have a big Nina Nina sign around it. Because it's really hard when you're completing a form to think back over the previous year, two years, five years about what situations you've been in. If you are going to be a barrister, you need to plot and plan, and then you need to plot and plan for yourself. So start thinking now, before you're anywhere near the stage of applying, what you are doing on a day-by-day -day basis, which means it could be, in a few years' time, the type of thing you work up into an example. Keep a running notebook on your iPhone, on your iPad, or you know, even old-fashionedly with a pen and paper, not quite a quill. It will seriously help. Because you'll be comparing examples, looking at them, refining them as you go along. So what does it take to get a pupillage? Now, this is an illustration about why I think this website is so amazing. It is witty, it is erudite, it is hard-hitting, it is focused, and it is awesome. And this is taken in its bulk from it. Because what's really annoying to those people who do get pupillage and are at the bar is to be told, oh, were you just lucky? Luck comes into it, but not after there's been a hard amount of graft gone into your application. So, it starts with your CV. It starts with having an excellent application form. It continues with you presenting yourself in the best possible light. It continues about you being able to cope under pressure. All of those qualities which are here on that screen is everything you need to show as a potential barrister. They are the basics. You are comparing yourself with Mr. Ms. Average, who will have a 2-1 from a good university, who will have done mini pupillages, who would have done potentially some marshalling, who would have done free pro bono work, who would have made a difference in the community they serve. And if they come from a family background where they don't have that type of access, they will have shown already, by the very fact they're thinking and come to the bar, that they are extraordinary people. That is your competition. Luck does not come into it unless you get off the starting box by doing that type of preparation and showing you've got the application, the brains, and the determination to see the journey through. As um, is said afterwards, it's after you've done everything about that, that's when it's lucky. So competencies. You know I told you about your little black book? Well, make yourself familiar with the competencies that are being looked at. They are down there. When you see them on the screen, they seem so blindingly obvious, don't they? It's not just about having the brain to analyse the evidence. It's not just about having the stress coping skills that means that you can marshal the evidence under the shortness of time. It's not just about being presentable so that even if you feel like you're dying inside, you can convey to your client that you are the person that should be trusted. It's not just about being able to marshal your argument and adjust to it when someone appears to come up with a better argument against you. It's not just about getting up every morning and doing the thing again and again and again, even if you think you've had a bad day in court the day before. It is about resilience. It's about intelligence. It's about adaptability. It's about determination. All of those skills you should be thinking of in terms of what you are doing in your daily life that you can apply to them. You don't have to hit all the buttons, but some would be quite nice. So, preparation for interview. Again, this goes back to the calls I get from people that say, why haven't I got a pupillage? Google your chambers. Remember what you are doing. You are researching. You are stalking, okay? In a legitimate way, can I just say, but you are stalking. You are looking at the chambers and seeing what's going on in their homepage news. If there's a case coming up, you go along and see if you can sit in it. You watch the Supreme Court in action. You look, in particular, not just at what the senior members of Chambers are doing that will be the headline stars that draw your interest, but you look at what the juniors are doing, and you try to think about, could I be them in a few years' time? What type of cases are they doing? What are their interests? Google everyone. With a Twitter profile, 
with a LinkedIn profile, you can see what people are doing in their professional and their personal lives. Talking of which, social media, we will track you. Right? All of your social media activity will be looked at as part of a pupillage application. So start thinking now. I do not want to see you propping up your friends saying, is there, is there a taxi home? Oh, there's not. We can sleep here. Anyone free for another one? I do not want, I do not want to see pictures of you looking really, really clever, not wearing funny hats. I do not want to see you behaving abusively on Twitter. I do not want to see you behaving abusively on Instagram. We will track everything because we have the ability to, because it's a public presence. So in the same way, you will Google the chambers, you will Google the people there that you choose to admire, and you will have a way of tracking to see what they do, which is useful not only in increasing your knowledge base of the chambers, but in particular, it builds up a confidence set that when you go there, you've got a better base in order to answer the questions from. Elaborate. Now, I did put in a question mark after that. Don't fabricate. When you are thinking of your examples, it's almost inevitable that you will gild the lily slightly because none of you are likely at this stage to be Lord Panic in junior form, okay? But elaborate, don't fabricate, because we will find you out. One of the skills a barrister have is detect a liar at 500 paces and to hone in and kill. Do you, we may not get to that ultimate stage, but we will suss out with you if you are giving an example which clearly is not something you can justify. And practice out loud. Now, anyone that came to my lecture last month would have heard me say right at the end of it, I felt like my tongue was sawdust. My brain was firing, the words were there, but I could not get my tongue to wrap around my teeth to get the words out. Really lovely people amongst you will, of course, say, that's not the case, Joanne. But in fact, that's how I have felt. Because I wasn't able, in the time I was standing up here, to absolutely perfect what I wanted to say. So I wasn't conscious of any mistakes or ums or ahs. I'm told I don't say those. Let's hope that's the case today. But I know that when I was given a mock silk interview by my husband the day before the real thing, I was a disaster. I was a puddle. I was so bad because I thought I had the answers in my head, but I hadn't practiced getting them out. There's no way I would have got silk because I simply hadn't set down the memory track between my brain and my tongue to let the words come out with the ease with which I had them in my head. I got silk. The interview was the next day. I aced it. I would not have done the day before. I was humiliated. I went to bed in a state of, as I say, a puddle. You should not wait until that stage before you practice, because if you practice now, you might get to the stage of being silk. Say your answers out loud. Failure. Okay, failure, like I've said, is something you're going to have to get used to, and you will be rejected for pupillage. Very few people get pupillage on their first application. There may be reasons for it. I'd like to think I can give you some in this, and the websites will give you others. But sometimes, in fact, we just don't spot your potential doesn't mean to say you're not going to be brilliant at this career in your next application or in another career if you choose to move, but failure is something you are just going to have to suck up. Mortifying, humiliating, painful as it is, because it will be part of your working life. And for every failure, the next day there may be a success for you to grab onto, and then you will forget everything that went before. So, stage two. Here you are, you've got your foot in the door, you've got your wig, you've got your gown on, you know, you're feeling very, very pucker. I am now just going to give you a few headlines about what worked for me in terms of building up my career. And I would like to think it started with my upbringing, which based, was based on the fact that you should be respectful to other people and polite, because you never know when you're going to need them, and you don't know what's happened in their day. When you walk into court make sure that you don't make assumptions about who you're working with. Your legal executive may be the very person who next year is going to be the pupil who's going to get in, make sure that everyone in the chambers knows that you were really rude and horrible to them in court. Be polite. Be respectful. Remember what it's like not to know what the rules of the game are. Don't assume that the legal executive or the solicitor on the other side has no relevance to you because I got my career carved out by being instructed by people who have been opposite me and saw me perform in court. Your audience is not just the judge. 
It's your opposing solicitor and your opposing counsel. Be really polite and respectful to the clerk and the usher. They are the judge's eyes and ears. Everything that goes on outside of the court will come in through the judge, through those two people. But it's a two-way street. As anyone who knows me well will say, my relationship with the ushers and the clerks has been a lifelong saving grace when I have needed help to get on first, to get off first, to know if the judge has read the papers, to know if the judge is in a bad mood, and just sometimes to slip a little bit of detail in about the case that I know is going to go back to the judge. Treat people with respect and you will have it returned to you in a hundredfold and make sure it's a lifelong relationship you're going to have. Be there first. Being there first. My way of operating to those juniors I've had has been described as being the spider in the web. I love getting to court early because I will try to make sure I get the conference room that's right next to the court. One, that means I get the, to the clerk and the usher first. Secondly, I get to see people arriving. I get to see the dynamics between people. Who's coming with whom and in what way. But most importantly, I get the chance to pick off my opponents to have a little word in their ear about a particular point before they've properly thought about it and in particular before they've spoken to anyone else about it. It is much easier to get an agreement or to narrow down the issues in dispute if you've done your work outside court, rather than waiting until the whole mass of the evidence against you has coalesced in a big negative no, because everyone's realised you really do have a problematic case. Pick it apart before you have to confront it. It's not rocket science. It is extraordinary how many people don't do it. You are on show. Treat your clients with respect and recognise you are in a public place. That means explain to your client in advance that you won't be by their side all the time and you will be going to talk to your opponents. It doesn't mean to say that you are ignoring them. It doesn't mean to say that you're cozying up with the opponent. Be particularly careful when you start laughing, as you will do, because we have to have gallows humour in our business. Explain to your client and your solicitor in advance that if you are laughing, it's not about them. Remember the people you have coming to you are desperate and in need. They do not have friends. They are not used to seeing friends dressed in suits. And if they see people in suits laughing, they are going to feel as though they're out of the fold. So you explain to them what you're doing. Be careful about things like screensavers. It's incredibly, incredibly insensitive in crime or family to have screensavers of your children up when you might be fighting a case involving children. Remember that everything you do and say and show is meant to reveal that you are the professional person in whom people can trust. So carving out a career at the bar, outside court, a reputation. It takes you years to build up a reputation and just one case to lose it. Don't take your temper into court. I can tell you from sitting as a judge, there is nothing more irritating than seeing squabbles played out by the advocates in front of you. It's irritating, it shows a lack of control. If you have an issue, you take it outside court. And actually, if you bring your temper into that environment, and Lord knows with the amount of stress that's understandable, there is nothing better to do than simply to apologize and to move on. Because we remember. When you're in court, treat your opponent with the respect they deserve. Some may not appear to deserve any. Some may deserve a lot, but you treat everyone equally. I will not forget a barrister who crosses me. Not only will I not forget you, but when I'm asked to recommend barristers, you not only won't be on that list, but you'll be very definitely on a list not to be used. Do not ever cross my juniors. If you are my junior and someone has been rude or impolite to you, there will be the wrath of Delahunty coming upon you, and you will know what hit you. We are a team, all right? Treat people with respect. If you commit to doing something, for example, drafting an order or doing a document for someone in chambers, and it becomes obvious to you you can't do it, do not leave it until the last minute to say sorry, because what you're doing there is dumping a problem on someone because someone has to pick up the pieces. If you're in court and you're committed to doing something, as I always say to my team, if we can't make a direction timetable in the order, you will say so in advance with a reason. You will not be so disrespectful that it passes and then you say, oops, I'm sorry, or you hope no one will notice because they will. Remember your role. You are not a social worker. You are not a police officer. You are not the doctor, you're not the solicitor. You are the barrister. 
which means that you do not allow yourself to become over-familiar and over-commit. Your body language has to be respectful. If there's going to be any hugging or kissing, it's not going to be you that's starting it. Remember how you are presenting yourself at all times. So outside court, in chambers you ask for practice meetings, you go in with an agenda which you've discussed in advance and you tell the, the chambers clerk in advance what you want to get out of it and you set a plan. Now I don't think I've had practice meetings in the course of my career since 1986 because I've always been a bit of a solo operator but I'm told they're very helpful. What I do know is the clerks are the people who keep your career moving, and if they're not keeping your career moving, then, as I shall say later, it's time to jump ship. Out of court networking, I've got down here social media. I have to confess, I've got no idea how LinkedIn works. I've got a profile on it. I post things. I don't know who these hundreds of people are that keep on asking to link with me. I keep on being terrified that someone like Jeffrey Archer is going to come along. I'll say yes, click on a link, and then he'll be had up for defamation. And all of a sudden, I'll be dragged into something because I've said yes to being their friend. I do not know how it works, but apparently you do because you are young. Do not think of asking everyone to be your LinkedIn friend because you will not get acceptances for the very reason I've said. There is a reason why LinkedIn is meant to have a connection system, and it's not simply I've asked you, so therefore yes is the answer. Social media, I've talked about, and Facebook. All of it will be plumbed to see how you're operating. Where else do you want to be going? If you are going to use these mediums for you, then decide which ones are for you. I use Twitter for me in my personal life. I have a private Facebook posting, and I have a private Instagram posting. But Twitter is my public forum, and I am very careful what I post on it. I may be outspoken. I think we should be if we have a cause to argue. But it will not be something personal about me. It won't be saying what I've done the night before. I try really hard not to like on pictures of dogs, but I'm somewhat losing the line on pictures of crows because I do think they're remarkable people. But that's almost as personal as it will get. But think what your medium is and then use it for that purpose as a platform because if you use it constructively, it can be a really good way of showcasing your talents to the world. And then when you're thinking about where else to go, public duties. Now, I put this word in brackets. For years, when I used to go to court, there'd be this muttering amongst some of the senior people talking about public duties. And no one told me what public duties were. It meant actually sitting as a judge or a tribunal chair, and it just made me feel very much on the outside and not on the inside. And it wasn't until someone suggested to me I apply to be a recorder that I thought, oh, my God, that could be me. Simply the suggestion that I could do it made me think there might be a door open there. So if you want to push your career forward, then think about applying for a recorder or a tribunal chair or a DDJ, because to get to see what it's like to have barristers and sisters in front of you, to see their mistakes and to have to deal with them makes you a far better advocate, I can tell you. Silk. A stepping stone. Stilk is where you want to be if you are going to be driving your career onwards and upwards. Because in Silk, you get the work you really thought you might aspire to doing. You get the hard cases. You get the cases on law. You get the cases on facts where there is no other option but for you to try to turn the case around. Silk is something that the majority of barristers would like to aspire to at the beginning of their career. They may not want it later on, their aspirations may change. But when we think of really, really superb advocates that we would want to either emulate or have act for us, then we are talking about silks because they offer the mark of excellence and individuality. So, carving out a career in court. That, what, what is that? It's not pink. I couldn't quite highlight it in terms. I am staggered. How many people do not think of their case as their opponent does? They simply pick up the papers and prep it on the basis of the instructions they are given. The only way you win a case is by looking at your case as an attack. Where are the weak points? What would I do if I was opposite this? Where would I, where would I spot the gaps? Because your strong points, you just need to burnish and give it a little bit of protection. 
your weak points are the ones you need to work on. You have to cotton wool them. You have to work out how to grab the points, and before it becomes one against you, you've already identified a way in which you can minimize its significance. Don't hope no one will notice, because someone will, and you really don't want it to be the judge, even if your opponent hasn't spotted it. And that is a bit of a high-risk strategy. So make sure you look at your case with the absolute critical eye, and you are prepared to be devastating about how bad it is. Because if you are, you may find some glimmers of light that then you can open up. Prepare your case. Do not limit it to the papers. You are employed to be a self-independent thinker and learner. You have the World Wide Web at your disposal. I have won many a case by going online and identifying research articles that come from, come from Australia or America and using them and deploying them against the expert in the witness box. I am perfectly happy researching research articles because I know I need that to level the base between me and the expert. Equally, Google to see what people have been up to in their private life, if they are the witnesses in your case. What have they been posting? You dig. You are the private investigator that has to have the, per the papers and then the outcome in court. Remember, you are part of a team. You do not go into any case alone. You're unlikely to be doing direct access, which means it's just you and the client. You are likely to have someone there working with you, whether it's a solicitor or whether it's a colleague, and it's most definitely the client. And you need to think of the client as part of the team because your case is only as good as the reliability of the information you get from your client, which means you need to be prepared to tackle your client head on. This is not the time to pussyfoot around the case. The poor barristers are the ones that promise something to the client that they really don't have a clear idea they're going to get. That is a foolish mistake to make. What you have to do is test your case out with your clients you do not want the most devastating cross-examination of a client to happen in court by your opponent. You want the most devastating cross-examination to happen within the four walls of your conference room where you really work out what the case is about, and it can shift. And you are imaginative. I've dealt with cases where I've been acting for very, very religious-minded people, or at least they say they are. And if I'm dealing with a dead baby and I want to know what's going on and I ask them whether they're prepared to tell the truth in court and what taking the oath means and whether or not it means a difference if they swear on the Bible in front of me as opposed to where they swear on the Bible in front of the judge, I will get a Bible out and I will make them swear on it. I'm not saying that will guarantee me getting the truth, but it certainly shoots a rocket up any sense of the complacency that just because I'm wearing a suit they don't have to listen to me. Think about your style of engagement with your client. Be adaptable. And remember to explain that you are going to be different in conference than you are in court. I am quite confrontational and quite... Uh, one of my juniors here is laughing. She's seen me in conference. I am quite confrontational or I'm quite comforting, but the one thing I am is not a the type of barrister that you will then see in court. My language is different, I swear. I will say anything to jolt my client into a sense of realizing that this is the bottom line and they need to engage with me. But I warn them that that is not the same barrister they're going to see in court. My tone of voice will be different. My dress will be different. My demeanor to the judge will certainly be different. Make sure your client knows that you're more than a one-trick pony in terms of your style issues. And remember that you have to move the case along, not simply process it at the point at which the papers are given to you. So, what do I do when I get to my cases? I plot out when I am going. I'm not sure if I said it before, but I'll say it again. I will read those papers with an intensity that will never be replicated on a second read, because my first read is when I'm reading through to get a sense of where the case is. I absorb the facts and the data without actually understanding where the case is going to go, but our brains are miraculous things, and I can guarantee that overnight all of those pieces of paper that I've read, that I've shuffled along the floor in multi-piles, will somehow be reshuffled in my head overnight. So around three or four o'clock in the morning, I will wake up with a strategy, and most importantly, with an opening line for a witness. And that's happened because I've read the papers, I know what the shape is account about, and then I'm casting a case within the material instead of coming in with a preformed view. I am not afraid of managing expectations of my clients. You cannot 
lead your client down the garden path and promise them that you can absolve them of the allegations against them when you know the evidence is weighted. You have to bring them on that task and journey together. Because if you do challenge them, you may find the evidence from them actually can change the outcome. Or they may have done something. And if they've done something, it's better for them to tell you, it's not for you to make assumptions, it's better for you to know now so then you get the benefits of therefore effectively taking into court the mitigation rather than the defence, because even that change can change the outcome entirely. Be adaptable. Don't underestimate the judge. Questions have to be able to be tailored to the evidence. I cannot believe the number of advocates that I see who've got scripts written out. Question, 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 question. Do they not realize that in a question, 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 there's a witness going answer, 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 who doesn't know what your question, question, question script is? So what happens if the witness doesn't give the answer you carefully predicted for them? You go nowhere because you cannot adapt. What I do, if it's of any help at all to you, is I read the papers and I flag them up under issues. So that it doesn't matter what witness is in the box, I've got my issue set up, which I know I'm going to tackle with the witness, and then I've got my evidential references on the right. And everything is at a glance. Because the one thing I don't want to do when I'm on my feet is have to spend time flipping around pages and, pa and pages trying to find out where I am. I'm not using notes now. These are effectively my issue headings. If I was over here by this lectern, standing behind a lectern that's made for an average five foot eight man, may I say, not a five foot one woman, <laughs> then you have the notes here and I'd be looking down at them and I'm not looking at you. Who am I trying to convince? I'm trying to convince that there is a reason to be at the bar by looking at you and by engaging with the camera. Hello, Webb. It doesn't do me any good if I'm sitting and standing looking at a piece of black and white because you may as well leave the conference hall, go and pick the paper and then go and read it in the pub, but please don't do that just yet. So you have to have a way of being the grasshopper that's able to leap a leap from a blade of grass to the other in order to get to your outcome and to adjust your questions to the answers you are being given. Going forward, listen and learn. I listen and learn from my opponents all the time, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. We are never too old to think that that's a really good line or, oh my God, that's one question too many. If you are young or in a junior practice at the bar, do not think that you are not worthy to ask a question of any one of us. If we are barristers to the core and you ask us a question, we will want to answer it, admittedly when we have the time to do so, but generosity of information and knowledge is the hallmark of a good barrister. If you don't get a response, they're not particularly good, quite frankly. But that is what being a barrister is. It's about sharing knowledge. Be ambitious, you go to the extra mile. Are you prepared to be the pupil again? I've spoken at previous courses about the Keeble Advocacy course. It's where it's established for established practitioners. Two words of established, they're not happy with that sentence, may I say. And you go along and you will be taught by silks, you'll be given advocacy tips and you'll do mock trials. Are you prepared to put yourself through that process? Because sometimes you need to do that. If you are not going to be led by a silk, and that happens quite rarely, and that is the first time in which you can really see how some of the stellar people operate and it really ups your game, then you need to think about another way in which you're going to challenge yourself because we can't afford to stagnate at the bar because we are competitive and we are self-employed. If we don't get the work, we don't earn the money and we can't stay. There is no safety support network for a barrister. So you have to fight to be remain at the top. And what about the cost of success? I have spoken at a previous lecture, I think it was June 2019, that the cost of this drive to win, the cost of this drive to succeed, can be immense. We work hours that are too long. We don't see enough of our family. We are not good at taking care of ourselves. Work comes first. That is changing, but it can only change if we have people that come from a generation which understand that there is an off button, who come along and make sure that we behave better in order to encourage the next generation to do better than we have on a work-life balance. So I'm not going to do a downer in this session about talking to you about what the problems are, because I sincerely hope that by the time you come to the bar, we would have done better about dealing with them, or you're going to be better about calling them out. But there is a cost 
to being a competitive, driven individual. And that is what you need to think about when you think about whether you're going to succeed amongst us. What happens when it really just isn't working? Well, you've got a number of options. You can move chambers. You can take a cue from someone that sees potential in you, who shakes you out your sense of fear or complacency or inertia, and says, you must move. Now, that's not an unrealistic thing to do. I am quite happy to explain to anyone who asks that I left one chambers to another, not because I was unhappy, but because I wanted to remake myself. I wanted to go into a chambers to effectively cast myself in the best bits of my personality and my practice. And I wanted the challenge of going to that chamber to say, this is what I want to be and this is what I want to do without any baggage, and then the, having the responsibility to deliver it. Moving chambers does not mean that you are rejecting what's gone before. It means that you are looking around and deciding to make positive changes. You have control of your career. You are self-employed. So move chambers. Being a barrister means that you've got transferable skills. That applies in two ways. The first thing is you can get you drunk the groove. I came to the bar to be a human rights employment barrister. I was not a very good human rights barrister because I didn't get the work. I was not a very good civil barrister because, in fact, I really don't enjoy paperwork. I came into the law to make a difference, and making a difference for me means going into court and changing it second by second, minute by minute, witness by witness. I am not a paper practitioner. But I became a very, very, very good child protection barrister in an area where I would never have contemplated having a career and carving it out because I jumped from one type of specialism to another and found my feet. That's what you can do. You can also leave the bar. There is no shame in leaving the bar if it's not working for you. And why would you waste all that time, all that energy, all the skills you've gained by staying in it if it's not delivering for you what you want? You have transferable skills at the envy of the industry world and the corporate world. You can cope with stress. You can marshal information. You can advocate for a cause. You can deal with a multiplicity of issues and still go into court day after day. All of those are amazing skills which you can transfer to the corporate world. You do not have to stay in an environment which is not working for you because the bar is the most inhospitable if, in fact, it's not working for you. And you have all the right from all those years that you have spent to move elsewhere if that is what's going to make you happy. And there is no shame in that. There is a positive benefit. So what makes the leaders in the field? I was trying to think, remember this is my personal, my personal list, my personal thought. And I was trying to define it what it was. There is no substitute for preparation and hard graft. You do not see Law Panic live in front of the Supreme Court without knowing that he has spent every single waking moment trying to work out the way through the knots in the law. That's not because someone's given him a briefing note. It's because he has deployed his big brain on trying to work out what he has to say and what points he has to argue in order to make sure he wins his case. That takes hours and hours of dedication. Style. There's something about a really good silk that means that you want to watch and listen and what you're, to see what they're doing. It is about someone who's got something extra that can command the courtroom and can change the atmosphere when they stand up on their feet by gauging the temperature. It's about having charisma. You can be a very effective silk, I'm sure, in other fields, if you don't have charisma, but it really helps if you do. Commitment and confidence. The confidence to say something that no one else will and to argue a point when it's being knocked back. No one wants a weak silk that the first sign of indignation or disbelief, or rejection of the argument from the judge, says, oh, all right then. That's not what we are there for. We are there to make an argument and to try to make sure it's heard properly and loudly and preferably convincingly. We are not there to take a step back when the going gets tough. We are the people that should be stepping forward so you can come behind us. That needs confidence and it needs commitment because commitment means you've got to be the person that's going front of the line to take the flak, just as you should be there standing aside when there is uh, praise to be shared. Being prepared to be the odd one out. 
the greatest advances we have had in law have been where a barrister, a legal team, has decided that the law is wrong and needs to be changed and can only be changed by challenge. They are the people that didn't accept the previous precedents. They are the people that didn't accept that this is what should be happening. They are the people that work out a way in which to appeal, and they have the confidence and the wit and the intelligence to go and appeal it and to deal with it. Being prepared to be the person that makes the law as opposed to following law is a hallmark of greatness. So I was thinking about what my personal roll call would be, and... I decided, I decided that it would be my own Jodie QC um, <coughs> list. It will be based on who are the people who, when they stand up in court, I want to listen to because I just don't know what's going to happen, in a good way. Who are the people that have got the ability to change a case in the course of a cross-examination or a speech? Who are the people who come into court not simply with the knowledge gained from that case, but have got the layers of knowledge built up over the years and the decades, which means that they are simply giving the court the top icing on the whole cake of their knowledge. Because over the years, we acquire knowledge which is irreplaceable and which is unique to our practice. And that means that when you ask us to act for you, or when I'm opposite someone that's acting, then I know that what they're calling upon is knowledge culled from hundreds of cases, not just the one they're in, which is why they are so adaptable and successful. I was looking for people that can cope with failure, that they are committed to the outcome, but when they don't succeed on the case, that doesn't mean to say they don't come back weakened the next time. They cross-examine themselves about where they've gone wrong and what they can do better. And yet they still want to fight. They still come to court the next day to make sure they've got something to say in the best way because the next day may be a win. And so I was looking at these people and thinking, to a certain degree, in different ways, the other thing that unites them is they're all fighters. They are all outspoken fighters, and that just illustrates why, to me, we need these type of characters. In different ways. I'm not saying that I can imagine Lord Panic here with his boxing gloves off. But he is a sparer of words. He is a person who can conjure arguments up in a way that is sophisticated and erudite and witty. Paul Story, in my field, we are routinely called the Mr. and Mrs. of the family bar. His cross-examination can change <coughs> cases because he's got the ability to stand up, to marshal the facts and to power through, with sometimes with charm, sometimes with bullishness. His knowledge of medical evidence is superb. Alison Grief, who's not on that list but should be, her knowledge of medical cases is so superb, I really think that sometimes she should be doing the operations instead of being the surgeon dissecting the evidence. Helena Kennedy. The work she did and the work she's done for uh, Green and Women and such like has been remarkable. And then I think about Mike Mansfield and Mark George who Mike, because I was in his chambers at Took's Court from 1988 for 15 years, which meant we went through the Birmingham Six, we went through the Maguire Fours, we went through the riot strikes, the poll strikes. Mike was the person who would go down to the magistrate's court to go and take the point because he wanted to win the argument because it was so unjust. And it was Mike and Mark who I worked alongside with in Hillsborough. Mike, who managed in some type of magic that perplexed all of us to make a point out of a missing tape that was a dead point on paper. A Mark, whose work you'll see, he's the person who's still down there making sure he's arguing the cases that need to be argued. Check him on Twitter, because only this week he talked about being able to have a not guilty verdict returned for a juvenile who was facing a charge for attempted murder and just reflected on what difference that makes for that boy leaving court with his girlfriend and going back to his home. That's a life-changing moment. And then Karen Monaghan, a supreme role model, one of the few women who's consistently in the Supreme Court, and she hasn't got there saved by charisma, dedication, and the ability to fight. So these are, I think, some of my icons. And why are they? Why do we want to be a barrister? Okay. Why do we want to be it? Now, go back to what I said. That You might say, if you're coming, I want to change the world. 
I've been inspired by. Well, I said it wasn't something to use in your pupillage application form, but to be frank, there's always that voice inside us. We can change history. We did that in Hillsborough with the support of the families. We can challenge decisions in Parliament that railroad through our democratic rights. We can change the law so that a woman who'd been imprisoned, having killed her husband, as we now know, under a long programme of coercive control, is able to be freed. We can change our understanding about medical science and what it means to be a young parent accused of, of brutally murdering your baby when, in fact, that baby had rickets and vitamin D deficiency and the injuries, the injuries were entirely benign. And we can change the profession because by being out here and by talking about the work we do, we can encourage others to come and join us because if we don't have new blood in, if we don't have new thoughts in, if we don't have new experiences in, then we won't have the capacity to change the law and to make it adapt to the society we have to serve. And absolutely, when I'm talking about being a trial advocate, and it's, for no, it's not an accident that Marshall Hall was on that previous slide. I'm going to have to turn, because I can't see it from this distance. My profession, said Sir Marshall Hall, KC, and that of an actor are somewhat akin, except I have no scenes to help me, no words are written for me to say, there's no back cloth to increase the illusion, there's no curtain. You are alone as a barrister when you're asking questions. There's no one there to ask them for you, and the consequences of your questions can be profound. One too many, the case collapses. One not enough, you don't win it. And what do we do with that responsibility? We try, as he says here, out of that vivid living dream of someone else's life to create an atmosphere, for that is advocacy. And that is why this job is awesome. So is it worth it? Yes. Yes and yes again. There is nothing better than being in court and being in charge of the material that no one else has quite got their handle around. Or they think they have, and then before you realise it and they realise it, you've nailed the point because you have done the elephant in the room exercise. There is nothing better than understanding over the course of the case that you are changing it, witness and witness, and then by outcome. There truly is nothing better than to be a barrister and to know that you have genuinely made a difference. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why, despite the trials and the tribulations, you should be thinking about being a barrister to make a difference to the world we live in. Thank you very much.